Welcome to the podcast from Eden Worship Center. Because we believe that it is God's Word that does God's work in God's people, we want you to hear the gospel preached in the gathering of believers. We want you to read it for yourself and to join us as we think together and talk together about the sermon from this past week and what's going on in our world. You can join the conversation by sending in your comments and questions to EdenWC at Hotmail.com. May God cause His Word to come alive in your heart today. Well, all right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Midweek Podcast. This is Pastor Matt here. Thanks to the snow. Uh, recording this just a little bit different. I'm actually in the basement of my house while the rest of the family is upstairs. So if you hear some hooting and hollering uh, coming through on the podcast, that's what's going on. But I want to just take a couple minutes and talk with you a little bit about the sermon from Sunday, about our Follow Me series, looking at discipleship and evangelism, which are so closely tied together that we're all called to be growing in our knowledge of the grace of who our God is, of, of what salvation looks like in our lives, of that good news that we have to offer to other people. And so just a quick recap on Sunday, we talked a little bit how Luke 19 verse 10 says the son of man came to seek and save the lost that that was Jesus mission on the earth to seek and save that which was lost. The way that he did that was through the proclamation of the gospel number one. And number two by spending time with people spending time in discipleship with his his own disciples his own people uh, pouring into them uh, spending his life with them. And uh, secondly, spending time with those who did not know him, those who were the outcasts of society, the outcasts of the religious crowd in that day. And Jesus both proclaimed the gospel, spoke the good news, and spent time as he lived that out and helped apply that, bring that with flesh and blood into their life. Uh, part of what we talked about just briefly was that relational aspect seems to be so sadly missing in much of the church today, that so much of what we have, the model of church that we have, is not actually based on relationship. Uh, it's based on some sort of presentation or a show or entertainment. Uh, what, what is that entertainment value that one church has over another, rather than where can I build deep and lifelong relationships that will help me grow deeply into my knowledge of God. So the need for relationship is foundational to building fellowship. It's meant to build towards fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. The same thing is true for evangelism. If we're going to effectively share the gospel in this generation, a generation that has become de-churched, they're no longer part of everybody growing up being part of a church where you've You've always grown up going to Sunday school. You grew up going to church. And even if that wasn't part of your regular routine, at some point in your life, maybe grandma and grandpa or a friend or somebody else would take you to church. And now so many in this generation are growing out without having any part of that, any part of knowing what it is to be part of a church. In fact, the only thing that they have is suspicion towards the church. So if we're going to have the opportunity to share good news with them, it means we have to invest in building deep relationships with them. And it's more than just a evangelistic ploy. These are men and women who've been made in the image of God. In fact, we're going to talk about that a little bit the next two Sundays, Lord willing, uh, that mankind has been made uniquely from all the rest of creation in the image and the likeness of God. So whether or not they know him or not, they bear his image and they have value and worth. That means they're actually worth us getting to know. Not just getting to know so that hopefully one day you know, we can see them get saved and become part of the church. Because I think too many Christians have done that. They've built relationships just so that they can see that. And if that doesn't happen, well, then they just drop them and they go on to their new project. And it, we view people as projects rather than as people. And spending time with them that we might know the individualness that God has made them, the uniqueness with which God has made them. Uh, part of our call, and we find this in Greg Finke's book, Joining Jesus on His Mission, again and again, is learning again to enjoy people. That rather than seeing them as uh, impediments to what we need to get done, they are the mission. They are the goal. Spending time with them, getting to know them, uh, valuing that time that we have with them. So, 
There's a couple different things on Sunday that we talked about. One of them was, again, to quote Greg Finke, our our challenge that we have when we come to evangelism, uh, to sharing the gospel, to becoming actively involved in our neighborhoods, the, the places where God has already placed you, whether it's where you live or where you go to school, or uh, maybe it's the parents that you sit with at your your kids' games week after week. It, wherever it is, these are neighborhoods where God has already connected you with people. And it, here's what Greg Finke says. Our challenge is not a lack of knowledge. It's not that we don't know enough. It's not that you haven't uh, heard enough sermons on sharing the gospel or uh, you, you haven't been around the church long enough to really understand what's going on. Uh, Finke says it's actually a lack of action, that we just don't take action on that which we already know, which is that God doesn't take perfect people. He doesn't work with those who have everything all figured out. He takes imperfect, broken people like you and me messed up people like you and me. And in his grace, he is sanctifying that, that churchy word that just means making us holy. He is building us, forming us into the likeness of Christ. And so we're not looking for a finished product to go and hand out to these people. We come as broken, unfinished works that the Holy Spirit is still working and shaping in our lives. And we let them in on that process where they get to see our successes and our failures, that they might see our repentance, our confession, and how we acknowledge sin totally different than the rest of the world. Uh, It's so important, uh, just that brief thing, and I I love this illustration that Finke uses uh, of this Choloteca bridge that the river has moved. So if you weren't with us on Sunday, uh, it's this bridge that's in Honduras and they had this huge hurricane come and stop right over their area, dump so much water that it actually moved the riverbed. And when the hurricane and all the water subsided, the river was now moved and the bridge didn't go over it anymore. And it, there's such a a great parallel. And in fact, it's a scary parallel when you think about with the church, how the river has moved back in the 1950s. Everybody knew the same basic things about the church and Christianity. Uh, even if they didn't go to church, they, they had a very solid understanding of a Judeo Christian ethic that governed most of America. And that is just not true today. People have a different starting point. It, that means we have to change our methods. We can't just uh, do the same things they did in the 1920s or 30s or 40s and expect to see results if we live in a de-churched generation where they don't speak the same language, they don't believe the same basic things. We have to find a way to reconnect or else we can be a perfectly strong bridge. I mean, that that's what Jesus says. Like, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We can have everything strong and perfect within the church. But if we're so disconnected from the society that God has placed us in, the neighborhoods God has placed us in, then our gospel outside of ourselves has become useless. When instead we are meant to be a light in darkness, a city set on a hill that everyone sees. That this is good news that we've been called to share. And so one of the things that Jesus did when he came to proclaim good news was he started where people are at. I, I think one of the mistakes that we make so often when it comes to sharing our faith is expecting that we're going to have some brief gospel presentation with them, uh, some four-point step that we lay out. Here's, here's the gospel that you're a sinner, that you can't save yourself. Christ has come to save you. Therefore, submit your life and surrender to him. Only if that is true, and maybe, maybe God has ordained from the foundation of the world that somebody is going to believe that, only at the moment of hearing it, just like you and I, we heard the gospel shared how many times before we finally believed? That we had people praying for us and reaching out to us and loving us. And time and time again, we rejected it. We we weren't actually there yet. Maybe, and I'm just, again, I'm sitting in my basement and I'm thinking if somebody is standing on the other side of the room offering something to me, only I am 26 steps away from them. I can't just reach out my hand and take it. It's going to be a succession of steps before they get there. Now, 
uh, one of the one of the things that you you hear no matter how far you've gone it's always one step back and, and that's true there there isn't steps that you have to take that being a christian is not a 12 step program of fixing yourself that that's not it at all the the reality is that step of confession and repentance and faith in christ is all that god asks for us in obedience and christ does all of the work we do none of it but just like you and me the people that we are spending time with and loving and building relationship and sharing the gospel, they may be where they're actually going to receive the gospel six months from now. And God, the Holy Spirit is working in their lives. He's drawing, by the way, he was drawing them long before you ever got involved. This is not your mission. You are not the central player here. God is. God is the one at work in their lives. So we have to be patient Walk with them. What step are they on? Maybe right now uh, the step that they're on is they need a Christian friend so that they can believe that not all Christians are complete jerks or hypocrites. Maybe that's the step that they're on. It's not uh, confess and repent right now. That'd be fantastic. We need to be offering that. But in patience, we need to say, okay, God, what are you doing in their life? What is the thing right now that you're up to? Because God will work in their lives, bringing them uh, to different parts of belief. Uh, Romans 5, 9 says, Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. The truth is that God saves us when we are his enemies. That means there's a whole list of things that are going to happen after that as sin is put away and sin is put to death and righteousness is put on. We're learning to walk in a whole new way. I I love the illustration of Jesus meeting with the woman at the well in John 4. Uh, They're going through Samaria. Uh, Good Jews didn't even go through Samaria because they were uh, contaminated people. They, They were half in and half out when it came to worshiping God. So they, they wouldn't even go through there. But Jesus and his disciples plow right through. Uh, Jesus comes in contact with this Samaritan woman. Uh, again, good Jewish men would not have even spoken to a Samaritan woman. And yet Jesus spends time with her. Uh, he, we could say, gets to know her. But the truth is, as the Son of God, he knew her. In fact, in the conversation, he lays out, uh, man, you, you said rightly, this isn't your husband. Then he lays out her life. And she is undone and unveiled. And she says, come see this one who told me everything I ever did. And Jesus' disciples come back. They find her talking, uh, find him talking with this woman. And Jesus reminds them, man, this is the goal. This is the mission. And he, he calls to them. He says, open your eyes. Look for the harvest is white. It is ready. Now in people's lives, they're not always at that point where they are ready. Part of what we want to be doing as faithful ambassadors of the gospel is saying, God, where are they at? What stage are they at? What What is it that you need me to do in their life today? How can I be part of seeing them become ready to receive the gospel? Because sometimes uh, we go in and we share the gospel and they reject it. They don't want it or they say not right now. And we're like, well, I guess I tried. I'll give up and move on. Man, sometimes it just takes time. It takes consistency as God works situations in their lives and brings them to that place. When I was a kid uh, in our backyard living in Topeka, uh, we had this apple tree that was sort of way back in this backfield. And the apples were just terrible, just not, not, <laughs> not great. But if you go early enough in the season and you tried to pick them, they wouldn't come off. In fact, what would happen is the the whole branch would break off because it wasn't ripe. It wasn't ready yet. If you wait too late in the season, uh, the lightest breeze comes along and just knocks them off the tree. And then the apples would just rot on the ground because there was no one to gather them. There was no one to recognize where they were, uh, draw them up together. Uh, and in fact, it made it difficult to mow the lawn back there. I remember as a kid, because there were so many rotten apples on the ground that there were bees everywhere and you'd get stung trying to mow around it. Man, that's quite the illustration when you think of the church reaching out to people that we often don't recognize where people are at. And so we're pulling them 
into the church. We're trying to pull them into the gospel as if salvation belonged to us. And it's just snapping and breaking off things in their life, things that they aren't actually at that stage yet. Or when they are ready, we don't recognize it. We're not being prayerful. We're not seeking the Lord on their behalf. We're not spending time enough with them to build those relationships. And so the moment sort of passes them by. And maybe they actually do uh, respond with genuine saving faith, but they're so mishandled and missed by the church that they fall along the wayside and they just seem to be rotting on the ground. Man, how much better when we are there because of relationship, uh, day after day, building that, that connectedness with them, genuinely enjoying them, where we can see God's good fruit in their life. I think that's one of the reasons we get frustrated with evangelism is because we forget it's God's good work in their life. We think it's our work, it's our job, when instead our job is to recognize what Jesus is already doing in their lives. And then walk with them, even if it's just one step for today. Not the whole thing. Not, maybe not all the way down the aisle to repentance and forsaking all of their sin or whatever that looks like. Maybe today it's just, I can have a Christian friend and not think he's a big weirdo. We're just having normal conversations so that down the road we can have spiritual conversations so that down the road we can have gospel conversations. That's what Jesus did. Uh, John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh. And it doesn't say, and then just preached good news and went away. It says, He became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, we've heard that so many times. The, the wonder and the mystery of that is just lost on us. It, it says, We have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. We should ask, what on earth are you doing with us? Why are you spending time hanging out with us? Whether it's us or looking back at his original disciples, the fact that he dwelt among us is shocking. Uh, Luke 19.10 again, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Mark 3.14, he appointed the twelve, whom he called the apostles, the sent out ones, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. Before we are sent out, before God calls us anything on his mission, he spends time with us that they might be with him. 1 Timothy 1.15 From the New Living Translation, I love how it says this. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. I love that. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Friends, if we rightly remembered that I am the chief of sinners, as another translation says, I'm worse than all of them, then we will not view people as projects, but as image bearers, made in the image of God just like us, and yet just like us, bent by sin, that God desires to redeem for himself. That means your job is to genuinely enjoy people, get to know them, and care about them. So how do we do that? We do it by building relationships, building trust. That only happens when we listen to people. So many times we go talk to people and all we do is talk and we don't listen. Have conversations. Hear where they are at. Have them lead towards spiritual conversations, pointing them towards Jesus as you walk together with him. That is one of the best questions that you can ask yourself when you are spending time with someone as you are praying for them. By the way, I would encourage you to spend as much time praying for them as you spend time with them. You're not the one who is effective in salvation. It is God's work that is effective in salvation within them. Therefore, we should be praying for God to do his work. But one of the questions that we're we're asking of the Lord, what is Jesus up to in this person's life? God, what are you doing in this person's life? How are you working in their life? How are you bending situations to point them to their need for a Savior? Man, reminding ourselves of where we came from. It's the same place that they are. Romans 5, uh, verses 6 through 10. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. 
but God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Oh, it is the power of God to save, is the life of God that he gives to us. Therefore, our job is not to save anyone. We get to enjoy people. We get to spend time building relationships with them and saying, Jesus, what are you up to in this person's life? How can I be part of your mission towards this person? We don't, we don't know if they will accept Christ. We don't know uh, what God's uh, call for them is. We, we don't know if they're part of the elect or not. And so we hold out salvation all day long. We call them to faith and repentance all day long. We love them all day long. So my call to you is begin spending time with people, not, not spending time with them as projects, spending time with them as those who've been made in the image and likeness of God. So ask a million questions, get to know them, dig deeper than just the surface and find out who they are, what they've been through, what they love, what, what they fear, how is God already working in their life so that you can be a part of it. Hopefully next month, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means that God has brought his kingdom into their life, that the kingdom of God is advancing upon the earth, that Christ is king over all things, and he is calling them to be one of those who is under him, subject to his rule, what it means for us to bring the kingdom to them. In between now and then, man, look for the people that God has connected you with, whether it's your physical neighbors, whether it is people that you work with or uh, know. In fact, I I love Mark Dever, who's the pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist, says that he intentionally goes to the same grocery stores and restaurants again and again and again, because you do that over and over and you get to know the people that are there. He's looking for opportunities to build neighborhoods with people build recognition with people, to have an opportunity to be part of what God is doing in their lives. So be praying about who it is that God has already put in your life, and then actively, you don't have to start with all the answers, just start having conversations with them. Start taking interest in who they are as people, and wait and see what God is up to in their lives. All right. Well, hey, that's it for this week. Hopefully, Lord willing, we'll be able to see you on Sunday, assuming that this snow lets up. So in between now and then, stay safe and warm. Be praying for who God is calling you to start building those relationships with that you might share the gospel with them. God bless you. We will see you on Sunday.